Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about Kimberley points made by uh, Aboriginal flint knappers in the Kimberley region of Northwest Australia. They mastered their own independently invented ways of pressure flaking uh, stone into beautiful spear points. I'll be talking about uh, the Kimberley points and demonstrating the Kimberley points that were made uh, in the late 19th century and uh, 20th century, all the way up to at least the 1970s, um, out of glass. Right. Um, now, the Kimberley technique is very different from the techniques used in North America. The North American Indians, um, we know this from historical accounts, when they uh, did their pressure flaking to uh, finish up bifaces and to make arrowheads and stuff, they would hold it in the palm of their hand like this, and they would press flakes off the underside with their antler uh, pressure flaker and the flake would pop off the underside the point is totally supported by the hand and the rest of the body is all locked in to build up the pressure that's necessary to uh, pop off those flakes kimberly knappers as you'll see here in a moment um, would pressure flake on a stone anvil while they were seated on the ground the anvil between their legs in front of them now i'm sitting on the edge of a uh, low veranda um, for my back but of course in the Kimberley those guys are sitting on the ground and uh, they'd have one leg extended out and usually the other leg was crossed in front of them you run through in front of in front of the anvil um, but it, they were uh, sit, seated on the ground when they did this technique um, now we know that they did a lot of pressure flaking before Europeans uh, came into the area uh, the first Europeans into the Kimberley, they didn't really start showing up in earnest until about the 1880s. Uh, they were in contact with uh, uh, Indonesian fishermen uh, going back uh, uh, several hundred years, and it's possible that they were getting glass from them. But we know uh, that most of the glass points that we've seen uh, in the uh, Kimberley knappers working, uh, most of that glass came from European glass bottles. Now those glass bottles started showing up in about the 1880s, 1890s, perhaps a little bit earlier, and they were traded all over the Kimberley, and this is one of the most common um, bottle types that the knappers were targeting to make glass Kimberley points out of. Now, if you look, the bottom of this bottle is kicked up. Um, it's a, They used to uh, have wine or beer in these bottles in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but glass is very thick, and you can pressure flake it, it's great for that. But since the bottom is pushed up like that, they were making the points out of the bottom of the bottle. Um, they are making their spear points out of the sides of the bottle, okay? I've got some fragments of glass. I'll try working a few of these down today. And as you can see, it's from this type of bottle. It's the green glass. And what they would do then is they would orient the spear point vertically within the side panel of the bottle. They'd first knock off the bottom, and there's a special technique for doing that. Um, and then, at least in some parts of the Kimberley, they'd use a hot wire uh, to get a crack started down these side panels and split them off into uh, rectangular sections. Uh, this is just a uh, arbitrary breakage from a broken bottle. I'm sure they did a bit of that as well. And uh, there's a lot more work involved in that because you're not getting a nice shape, a uh, rectangular shape to begin with. All right, that's from an old uh, that's from an archaeological excavation down in Sydney. Um, the glass was analyzed and uh, recorded, and they said they were going to discard it, so I grabbed a few pieces so that I could do this demo. All right. Now, one of the key things about these bottles, side panels, of course, are straight. All right, they're nice, nice and flat in terms of the long section. Um, now, with this particular piece of glass, for instance, you can see the shoulder of the bottle is actually starting to curve up like this. Now the problem with your Kimberly point, when you uh, nap that bottle, if you have any of that curvature coming up, the tip of your point, of course, is going to reflect that. It's going to be curved as well. So you don't want that. The section of the bottle that you want is that's the sweet spot, right about in there. All right. It's nice and thick as you get towards the bottom of these early bottles. You can see that's fairly thick glass at the bottom. Thins out as you get up towards the shoulders, and you can see that glass is getting quite thin up toward the top, it's starting to, to bend over a little bit. So I'd actually have to take off a bit of that where it starts bending up. Um, and the thicker glass is what you want. Now, modern-made bottles, too thin. 
with the possible exception of champagne bottles. Uh, they, they made the glass on those a bit thicker so they can deal with the pressures of carbonation. So you can occasionally have some good luck working uh, modern uh, champagne bottles. But these early glass bottles uh, were much better uh, because that glass is, is so thick on these. And of course technology from about the 1940s, 50s onwards started making the bottles, getting the, the glass really thin on that to save on costs. Now, we can see in the Kimberly Points in museums that as got the bottle technology changed across the 30s, um, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, machine-made bottles started coming in. This is actually a handmade bottle. Um, then the, that's also reflected in the glass that was used to make Kimberly Points. All right. Um, and again, the thicker glass you can get, the better. In the later, like 1960s up into the 70s, you see a lot of points made out of ovenware, things of that nature. Um, nice thick, thick paneled ovenware, not the stuff that's been uh, pre-treated uh, like you get in your kitchen shops today because that's been, uh, the glass has been tempered so it won't nap. But some of the untempered ovenware um, makes quite, it flakes quite nicely and you can make good points out of that. Um, yeah. Now, what else can I say about that? I think that's, I'll probably say a few things about the glass as I go on. Okay, so what are the other tools you need? You need an anvil. Um, now in the Kimberley, it's dominated by uh, quartzite sandstones, and that's generally what they used as an anvil. But you want something not flat on top, you want something with a lot of undulations. Um, because the idea there is that when you're doing the pressure flaking technique, you're going to use the undulations on the anvil, the little shelves and stuff, um, to help you hold the glass because that's going to be that's the one of the most challenging parts of the technique is being able to hold that glass so look for a, a stone about this size can be a bit smaller um, that has some good um, angles undulations now this one has a quite a prominent shelf on there this is a piece of sandstone from uh, um, the Hawkesbury sandstone around Sydney and it's got this well it's a saw cut actually it's but it's created this shelf and I use this shelf to great advantage um, probably a bit too much a bit of a crutch for me um, but that's because I don't have the strength or the techniques in this hand to uh, to really hold that glass firmly. So I use that that shelf as a as a crutch quite a bit. Um, okay, so that's that. Now the primary tool that was used by the Kimberley Aborigines to work glass was just a piece of I think it's number eight fencing wire. Um, this is an old tent stake. Okay, it's just you can get them in camping stores um, and they would hammer the end of the wire to the spatula shape like that and that's the tool that they would use to press off the flakes. And they would just pound it out with a rock and then you can work the edge down to the contours you want on a piece on your uh, sandstone anvil. And you'll see me touching up the edge possibly as we go along. And then I've just taken the other end and made it super thin uh, for doing the final serrations. All right. Now, I did quite a bit of pressure flaking yesterday to warm up a bit uh, for this demo. I haven't done it in, well, actually a number of years, so uh, I was practicing yesterday. Uh, really kind of, it's really hard on the body, this technique, and I hurt my hands quite sore today because I wasn't, didn't have any cloth wrapped around my wire. Now, I've done that today. I just took a rag from the shed and tied it up with a, with a piece of string that was laying around, and... Um, the nappers and the, the Aboriginal nappers in the Kimberley uh, did something similar. It's just padding, all right? just to protect your hand a little bit. Now, since I haven't done this for a while, I worked up a nasty blister there. You might um, anticipate that that will happen if you try this technique. I've got a couple band-aids wrapped around that today. And interestingly, I also worked up a blister on the tip of my little finger, so I've got that protected as well. Um, now, what else can I say? The, in the Kimberley, um, the Aboriginal nappers would have sheets of paper bark. And they put sheets of paper bark over their anvil to provide a bit of cushioning. I'm going to use a piece of leather today because I don't live in an environment where we've got paper bark trees. So I'll just make do with a piece of leather. And we'll go ahead and get, get started here shortly. Just trying to think what else I can say. Apologies in advance for the dogs walking through. Now, the techniques that I'm going to be showing, I learned from uh, Kim Ackerman. Kim Ackerman is, is uh, well, I think he's um, 
the last one who learned how to do this technique um, traditionally. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the, the elder uh, Aboriginal men are, are too old or infirm to uh, do this themselves because they're in their uh, 80s, 90s nowadays. Um, Kim learned how to do this when he was a young man in the 1960s. And uh, he's an anthropologist, archaeologist, uh, who's written quite extensively about the Kimberley and other parts of Australia too. And Kim came up um, a number of years ago now uh, to where I live and we sat down for an afternoon and he showed me the basics of the Kimberley uh, technique for pressure flaking and making stone tools. So what I'm going to be demonstrating for you today is uh, pretty much what Kim, Kim showed me on the day with my own tweaks and modifications to make it work for me. Um, so there, there are aspects to it that I'm not sure that uh, Kim would do things quite the same way. Hopefully we'll get together again uh, in the future just to compare notes now that I've done this uh, uh, quite a bit more from that, that first session. Okay, so I'm going to get started. That's probably most of the talking I'm going to do because what I find is I find napping videos with the heaps of talking a little bit annoying because I want to see the techniques. And the other thing too is the more I talk, uh, the less focused I am on what I'm trying to achieve and I screw up. Now, I will just generally say what the different things are that I'm doing. Now, the key thing about making Kimberly points is you got to get rid of that, that curvature, all right? We'll call that the belly. I think that's, uh, they, they had an Aboriginal term that was equivalent to that, the belly, and then the back of the point. That's the excavate side. It's got a lot of um, silica stuff going on from being buried in a well, I think it was, for a hundred years. Um, that's what's flaking off there, but the glass is still pretty good. Um, so the key thing is going to be getting rid, the initial focus will be to get rid of this curved belly. That dorsal surface, the, the back of the point, is perfectly shaped for pressure flaking. It's got a beautiful curvature, really easy to make flakes travel on that surface. So you don't do that until the very last. I will be removing flakes to this surface, but they'll be short, non-invasive flakes just to prepare platforms and things of that nature so that I can push flakes onto the belly. The belly is the challenge, okay, because you have to um, flake this in such a way that you get a relatively flat profile across this. Of course, this glass will be quite a bit narrower when I get down to that point. But by flaking it, trying to drive flakes towards the center, um, I'll be able to flatten out that surface. Now, most Kimberly points, glass Kimberly points, or quite a few, I'd probably say most from the ones I've seen, will have a, a little island, a little remnant of the original ventral surface of the glass running partway down the center of the finished point. A lot of times it's near the base that you can see it where the point's widest. Um, they weren't too concerned. They wanted to get rid of... Uh, as much of that original glass surface as it could, but they weren't too fussed about leaving that little island in the middle. And then the, the, the last uh, primary flaking stage anyway will be to run flakes and create that dorsal surface with uh, something of a ridge down uh, the center of the point. And then there's gonna be a lot of finicky little work to get the tip properly shaped, and then at the end I'll do some serrations, okay? Now, it's tedious, this first part, because i got to do a lot of attrition to get this thing narrow enough that I can start pushing flakes through. Um, I try to speed it up sometimes, and Kim tells me that this would happen in the Kimberly too by doing a bit of percussion, but it's always very dangerous because I tend to snap the, the glass across if I'm not too careful with this percussion. But I'll just try to knock off this little intruding part, squeezing the glass really hard. Catching this or not, just to uh, try to prevent it from fracturing across. Okay, so I've knocked off a bit of that edge. Um, I'm going to play it cautious and I'm going to do a lot of flaking with the pressure flaker to try to get this down rather than keep going with the percussion. If I had a lot of gloss, I do have a fair stack over there, but it, I'm cognizant of uh, my battery time and, and uh, the length of this video as well, but rather than having you guys see me break and get really frustrated over trying to percussion flake down the glass to the shape I want. I'm just going to do it by pressure. Besides, it helps you visualize the technique too. Okay. 
so enough talking, let's get going. Okay. So you can see what I'm going to try to do is get, I need to get this flat edge unifacially flaked. It is mainly flaked to the belly of the point. You see me do little bits of flaking to the back of the point just to give myself platforms for doing more flaking towards the belly. Now orienting the glass on the anvil you just gotta hunt and peck for contours that give you the support you need so you can go through and start pressing off those flakes. And when it's big like this it's a bit awkward but it'll get easier as it gets narrower eventually it'll get narrower I'm not trying to do too much inward force at the moment it's mainly just downward force I don't want those flakes to go too long I'm just trying to get the edge unifacially flaked one of the frustrating parts getting that edge on there
bit of an obtuse angle there, so I'm going to come back this, this side. off to that side and give myself a platform. The steel on this push flaker is remarkably soft. You can see the edge. It's going from a flat broken to unifacially pressure flaked. For the archaeologists out there, this Flakes that are produced by this are uh, morphologically very distinctive. Uh, let me finish retouching flakes. quite a workout. It's very thin up here at the, what will be the tip of the point. As I said before, I'm going to have to take a bit of that off back to about here because we're getting the, the shoulder of the bottle coming up. I don't want the tip of my point to have that curve in it. I'll have to go I didn't bother too much on the perimeter there. That's the original broken surface of the glass, but I don't think I really need to at this stage. I'll be shortening it up a bit, getting rid of some of that thinness, but I'll wait do that later. This is the area I did that percussion flaking. We left a bit of a scar on the dorsal surface. I need to bring that in substantially and then both edges need to come in towards the middle. Now the uh, platform preparation is critical. 
difference in any bifacial flint mapping technique similar to this. And they would just do what I did there. Scrape on the side of their anvils. But of course you can do that with another stone as well if your anvil that you've chosen isn't sandstone. edge there. And I keep continually bringing that back for now. And eventually that'll give me, there's some gooberage there, some irregularity from those percussion flaking scars that I'm sneaking up on. Each pass is taking them off about uh, maybe sixteenth of an inch of the margin. So a lot of passes required, as you can imagine, to keep working it back there. more access into that goobered area, that last pass, so I was able to push it a little bit further along. back through this last bit of flat edge as well. Just let me 
it's coming a long way. And a bit on this side as well. Bit of an obtuse, obtuse angle there where the glass, when it broke, it rolled over the, rolled over the edge a little bit. So I'm going to have to give myself a little platform there. See what I did by taking off that tiny little flake. It's giving me a surface now that I can push a flake down that ridge and start getting rid of that slightly obtuse area in there. See, most of that flat edge is gone now. There's a little tiny little pocket right there. Let's just see if I can get that out of there. A little bit worried about where I did that plot prep and pushed that flake through. That got it. one thing that with glass that you have to be very careful of is inducing lateral cracks. It can just be a tiny little crack that kind of starts in to the stone like that. And if you're not, if you don't notice it. And you're not really careful, you're screwed because it'll crack all the way through the point. And that sucks. For the archaeologists, we find all those different stages of broken points out on the archaeological landscape where they're making these points. They faced all the same problems as. Modern nap is doing doing this, of course, and they broke them as well. Okay, more attrition. I'll do a few more passes on this side and switch to the other side. This gets, sometimes it gets boring working the one side all the time. Again, as you noticed from the, the look of the thing, I'm not pushing flakes, I'm not trying to push flakes out onto the belly. That comes later. Just, uh, just working in the sides. Got a long way to go.
Okay, I'm going to shift emphasis now. Still maybe a bit wide, but I'm going to try to start pushing flakes further onto the belly. Now one of the fundamental aspects of flint napping, when you want to uh, drive flakes invasively, the edge that you're pressing from has to be uh, above the center line, closer to this face that I want to drive flakes onto than the other face. So in order to raise this edge towards the face that I'm going to drive flakes in, I'm actually going to have to nibble, take off small platform preparation flakes to this surface. I don't want those to be very invasive. I just want them to be limited to within probably about an eighth of an inch or so, the margin. And what that'll do by removing a series of flakes to this face is that'll raise that edge up towards to this face. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start that process. There's a number of ways you can do that, but I'll use a little bit of a edge crunching process, I think. Again, I'm just shearing off that edge, going almost straight down. You can see the little nibbling flakes that are coming off. Don't want those flakes to travel very far because I want to keep that dorsal surface as intact as I possibly can. But you have to do this, otherwise all those flakes that you'll take off towards the belly won't be any different than all the ones that you've seen me doing over the last however long it's been, hour. Shearing that edge. Using more of the flat of the tool than the end. A few of those went a little bit further than I probably should have, but that's alright. So. It's going to be attrition. It's going to take several passes to see if I can't get more of that belly flaked. Alright. Interesting to see how much attrition there is in it, into this metal tool. I didn't think glass would do that, but it does. It wears it away. You can picture this edge here all the way around. It's sort of a wall that I got to punch through. You can see that last flake punched through it a little bit. Didn't go very far. It only went that far, but it pinched, punched through this very angular edge. So that's the goal of this first series is to try to punch through that around, along this length. In order to do that, I've got to have that edge 
closer to the belly. Trying to punch through that wall a little bit there. I can't see that, can you? See how that's punching through that wall a little bit? the gestures that I'm using to do that have changed. Pressing much more in to the glass. Less straight down, more in to try to break through, punch through that little wall. See how I've raised just that little bit of flaking there has raised that edge up closer to the side. I'm going to take the flakes off of. The edge of the biface comes dangerously close to the wrist. Take some of those flakes. Just a bit scary. it a bit more. Keep coming down this edge. See how it's punching through the wall. There's the wall there, the remnant of it. And all the flakes above that now punch through it a little bit. Yeah. 
tricky to hold now right near this end. I'll try it like this maybe. the best ever near the sand, but it's getting tricky to hold. I'm not experienced enough with the technique to nut it out all the possible holding patterns.
Well, it's mostly gone. Just got a little bit more to the tip here. That's gone in those areas. As I look at this, I probably should have gone a little bit narrower before I started this process because it's still a fair bit of a dip between there and the center. And there tends to be a, this next series of flakes. A lot of times it can start stepping and not terminating very nice. And it's always better if it's narrower before you start that process. Well, this is a bit premature. We'll see how we go anyway. Oops. stomach in there. It. That was a pretty good one. And the next one crushed a little bit. Oh, bugger. Okay. It's taking pretty big flakes on that last pass. A bit too big. Something about the angle. I tried that different holding position. And then I perverse fractured the tip of the thing. That's actually a flake. That initiated from here, and instead of following nice and cleanly along the surface of the glass, it spiraled through and propagated diagonally across. Well, that's a bit of a bummer. Again, for you archaeologists out there, you'd see this. If you had the right training, you'd identify that as a perverse fracture. It would tell you a lot about the staging, actually, because if you think about it, Got the remnant of the wall there from that really steep initial pass. We've got the slightly more oblique pass that is breaking through the wall here. And you have the platform preparation flakes that allowed it to this, uh, this surface, but the surface itself isn't flaked. So just even this little piece um, tells you a lot. If you found that archaeologically, you'd be able to, to say quite a bit. In fact, you can see where we did the beveling, the reverse beveling here to get the flakes to go through the wall. If you look where it hasn't
broken through the wall over here, I still hadn't done that reverse beveling. So you note that that edge preparation is very different from the edge preparation here for the platforms. Okay, and then there's remnant grinding too, so you'd be able to anticipate that they were grinding their platforms before the pressure flaking. This is one reason we do experimental archaeology, is when we look at the byproducts like that, and then when we find them archaeologically, we can uh, we have a better basis for interpreting them. Well, that's a bit of a bummer. That's coming along fairly good there for a while. This isn't that uncommon in glass, especially when you're a newbie. on here now. Set back. Still got a lot of lengths to play with, though. I was hoping to do one of those nice big ones, but. work out like that. Flake ran from there all the way over to there, right down the squared edge from the broken tip.
trying to do this in a way that keeps the keeps that wall from redeveloping. So trying to basically do a bit of thinning while I rework the tip. Probably flattening is a better term. problem there. Here, the platform crush on that last one. That's not good. You can see how those flakes are now pushing even further than the, that second termination area. Now I'm gone incrementally further. That's the way we're going to get this whole area flat. I've just started it up here since I have to rework the tip in line. I've started it up there. A lot of attrition to go yet. Shearing off some of that sharpness of the edge that I just produced because those flakes just get like this hollow ground effect next to that platform. You don't really want that. So we shear that off. Sheared it towards the belly. Now I'm going to shear again towards the dorsal. Let's bring that edge back around. Try to get that flat edge a bit more reduced. There we go. That was actually towards the dorsal surface of the point, which I generally don't like to do at this stage, but I'm trying to reduce down that broken facet. The string's loosened up. of it left now. Don't worry about it too much and start bringing that edge in.
the way I broke the tip off before. I'm reluctant to hold it like that again. I'm gonna have to now. How far those ran? A whole series of them went almost to the middle. Okay, so that was that was good. And the flakes have changed morphology substantially as well. They don't have that angular shelf on their dorsal surface anymore. Much more bifacy. And doing that shearing towards the back side of the point, the excavate side, the dorsal side, the back, whatever you want to call it. Raised it towards that face. I'll see if I can keep putting some long flakes across. But couple. The last one didn't do so well. Move down the edge a little bit. Not quite as long. That's all right. This is not stepping yet. Good. That one was pretty. Uh, to there. Then I uh, crushed the next one. Backed up on the pressure flaker a little bit too. See if I can't get a bit more flex into it. That is to say, I'm holding it a bit further up the handle. Okay, that's what I mean by the minute step fracture. Just very, very subtle, but it's there. And what tends to happen then is flakes that come afterwards will uh, stop at the same point rather than pushing through that area. And one of the reasons that's happening, that happened on that scar, I've been pretty lucky up till then, was because it's a bit too much of a dip. So it went in there, couldn't keep running, and it stepped out. That's alright though. You see it all the time on the originals. 
I don't think they were that concerned about it based on how often I've seen it on the museum specimens. I'm more worried about getting that flat, flattish cross section perhaps. Okay, now in that awkward holding area. Yeah, that's not so not so conducive to really loading up that platform. That one wasn't so bad. Stepped out though, as you can see. Another slight little step. Let's see if we can't run that ridge there right next to it. Yeah. Crushed a bit. Okay. Reasonably happy with that series. See if I can't do it on this other side, see how far I can push them on this side. That's the weak point there, it only went in that far and stopped, but the rest of them are about in that zone, which isn't too bad. Okay. I'm not too worried about the shape at this stage, we'll get it a bit more pointy later. Steering it towards the excavate side. To raise that platform. Actually do a bit of a reverse bevel here. Sometimes the bevel puts it a little bit too close to the side you want to take flakes off of. And so by doing another series back towards that same face that so you're going to take flakes off of, it resets the center line closer to the center of the mass. Call that a reverse bevel. ridge next to it to try to do another one parallel. If that platform's stout enough. Yeah it was. I went to there. I'm a very slow napper, by the way. I have read historic accounts that these guys could keep out these points really quickly. But I sure as hell can't. Crushed. Move up a little bit. sometimes whether uh, working on flat on the ground rather than having my legs the way they are might be a bit of an advantage leverage wise as you can raise up your you'd be able to raise up more of your weight onto the pressure flaker whereas I'm using more of my arm muscles so that might be a argument for actually doing this on the ground rather than on the edge of a veranda 
crushed a pot for him, which is too bad. I had a good series going there. I don't know if I'll be able to push past those or not, but we'll try it. We'll try another pass. Let's finish this one first. See, basically, it's that was that second wall we created. And I'm just pushing through that. And they're just coming out here and they're feathering in the in the dip, which isn't too bad. Um, still pretty bloody wide. Like I said, I should have made it narrower before I started this process, but that's all right. Got impatient. thing you got to be careful of when you're doing this series of pushing them in is not to go too close to the one you just took off actually come down a little ways so that you can run that ridge if you come too close it'll just step out in that previous flake scar so that's something that beginners and mistake beginners often make they don't space their flaking out enough Sound like a good platform. I got away with it, kind of. So they're all they're all ending about there, but you can see it's still not flat yet. It's going to take at least one more series, possibly even two. I'd say almost certainly two because it's still pretty bloody wide. area to hold now. Into the first pass, so those went up about into that area, and this side about into there. And I have seen original ones with about that much island on them, but usually there's a bit less than that. But we'll get, well, we'll see. If I can push past some of these little tiny steps, I'll be able to get more of that island. And the base needs a bit of a bit of work at the moment, so let's do that. Here towards the dorsal surface. Do another one, I think. Actually, very. It's 
surprisingly dug in there. Didn't think it would do that. It's all right. Sometimes you can get a fair bit of that bottom bit of remnant belly from the base. Don't want to have much luck at that. That's all right. I'm mainly trying to reduce down that little bit of shelf from the first stage. But it's awkward to hold down at the same point. It's actually a part of the original broken surface of the glass right there. You can tell by the opalescence. Reverse beveling, so I'm shearing towards the face to re-establish the mass relationships that I want, so I can push through. I don't mind a bit of attrition at this stage of the sides too, because the point's too wide. So I'm going to do that now to the other face.
Boom. Whenever you hear that crunching, it's not a good sound. Well, the second series didn't go that much further than the first. It's all right. Again, it's because I made the point too wide.
reconsidering whether I should go for another pass. But from prior experience, I could possibly get more of that belly. Is it worth it? I'm gonna do the dorsal. goes to plan I'll be able to get most of this dorsal surface in one pass. I have noticed on Aboriginal ones that they sometimes will go back and do a bit more work on it. But let's see how they go. I mean remember that I haven't flaked at all on this face except for these little non-invasive flakes that came off in preparing platforms. Alright, they only intrude just a little ways. Now the next step, it's a nice contour there, the next step is I've sheared that edge and I raised the face towards the excavate one. And I'm going to do a series of flakes. The plan is to get him to go about to the middle. We'll see how we go. Out that platform, probably too stout. You can see, see how the flakes go right to the center. Of course, those flakes would be diagnostic, wouldn't they? I was a bit worried about that platform not being stout enough. I should have followed my instincts. Kind of short, not quite to the middle, don't like that. I'm 
trouble with support at this end, as always. That's better. Okay. That was the first pass. Let's see, those came up short. Those are okay. That's a bit short. Don't know if I'm going to be able to meet those or not. Give it a go, though. I'll give it a go. So I haven't been able to quite get it. There's that little bit in there that I wasn't able to get. But I can. I think I'll be able to do another pass here in a minute. And uh, get some of that. Ideally, you just get it in the first pass. But of course the wider the point is, the harder it is to get all that. Get a bit more flex in my flaker. Collapsed again. Bend in my flaker too. Something risky here. A little blade like flick. Ran it up along that arras and got a little bit more of the original surface. Got most of it. Still got a little bit more to go. You can see the, that it does actually take off quite a bit of the thickness of the glass when you run this last series. You can see 
the skeleton that, that margin is. It's a little less important to to get all that at the tip of the point because that's all going to go by attrition anyway when I do the shaping. Get it all, but that's alright, that'll come off soon enough. It's just finding it awkward to hold in there. Still one more chance at it, I think. Okay. What do we got? Another chance at it from there, but I'll worry about that later. Okay, so how good did that go? Um, it wasn't a disaster, but it certainly wasn't what I'd hoped. The ideal is to get all these flakes to meet in the middle, eliminate all this original surface of the glass, and create a prominent ridge right down the center. I got the ridge okay, but I've got those remnant islands of glass. Now I could uh, re reform the edge, go back and, and remove those. I don't think it'd be that difficult to actually get the rest of those. But I have seen that on the originals where they occasionally be a little bit in the middle, and it's usually on the longer point or the wider points as well. So that's not too surprising, but I would have liked to have gotten them. Um, Overall, I'm, I'm reasonably happy. I'm not entirely satisfied with this. I think uh, it could have been a little bit flatter. But again, it's within the range of variation that I've, I've seen on the, the actual Kimberly points. Okay, so I'm reasonably happy with that. I might run a flake up from there. But, of course, you never do your best work in demonstrations. It seems like it always happens when you're working by yourself. Um, one interesting development on my pressure flaking tool, you probably can't see that very well, but uh, there's a little bit of a dip forming in that part of the spatula edge. A tiny little dip forming right there. That's the, where I was contacting the uh, pressure flaker with the platform and there's a little bit of metal attrition going on there. And that fits in really well with uh, a metal pressure flaker I saw in a uh, it was wrapped in a bark bundle with a bunch of blanks and pressure flaking tools and all kinds of stuff. And the tip of that pressure flaking tool had that exact same feature with this little dip right here is on both sides of, of that one from rotating it back and forth. Now, and that came from putting really hard, stout, a lot of pressure right on that point and it caused attrition to the metal. So. That's, I like that when I see those sort of features forming on my tools that are matching what I've seen in the ethnographic ones in this case, or the archaeological artifacts. Um, it means that you're, you're on the right track as far as your replications go. Time to bring the tip in. And this is not something I particularly enjoy, but we got to do the shaping now. Bring 
those margins in to make it pointier. And I'm not too worried about getting really long flakes. When I do that, and I'm going to be using both sides, I no longer am going to avoid the dorsal face, face like I was there for a while, for most of the reduction actually. Now I'm going to be using both faces equally to get that tip shaped properly. It's interesting to think about this very specific reduction sequence that was followed in the Kimberly by these guys when they were flaking glass. It was all... They used to do the pressure flake... Well, they still... They At the same time they were doing the glass, they'd still work in stone too, of course. And they basically exapted their... adopted their techniques from working stone to this new material that came into their lives, this glass. And there must have been some R&R &R happening in the late 19th century amongst these nappers on what's the best production method for producing these points out of these these sides of bottles and this is what they came up with but I find it interesting that they wouldn't flake the dorsal surface of the bottle the excavate surface till the very last because they quickly figured out that that's um, the perfect profile for for pressure flaking. Doing that R and R process. And if you flake it too early, you lose all the advantage of of having that profile. You want to get the width down to the point where you'll be able to drive flakes all the way across before you pressure flake that uh, dorsal surface. Because I could have done it, you know, you could do it in a really early stage, but you probably wouldn't be able to get the flakes to go all the way across. And so you'd have that bloody big island, probably step fractures or terminations that would be hard to push through later in the sequence. So the best way is just to avoid flaking on that side to the very, one of the very last stages. Still got a bit of that broken tip. I'm just going to bring both, both edges in, work on that one next, bring both in, and then we'll do a fine tip on it, see where we're at. Got a bit of a problem right in this area, some collapsed platforms that I'm not very happy about. Careful not to make the platforms too stout. That one was too stout. It took a too big a bite out of the edge when it came off. Because I was in the habit of preparing super stout platforms for that really heavy pressure. And so when you transition to doing more flaking, uh, shaping with smaller flakes, you got to remember not to make your platforms quite so stout. By stout, I mean really heavily ground. Okay, now you can see it's still a bit bulgy there, so that's good. I'll go through, shear that, take that mass off. I was fighting the urge to hold the pressure flaker like I would to do the North American style.
quite as much mass as I'd hoped. Massive edge collapse there, that wasn't so good. That's alright. And that one went to there. The ramp banked it up a little bit too much there. I'll have to do that in another pass. Now, again, just bringing this, these edges in. to that island. That one wasn't so good. It flared out, spread out. I'm getting a good, fairly good ridge there though.
lot more of the belly. Trying to go for more of that, but it came up short. Um, you can see the edges needs to come in on this side to get it a bit more parallel. I don't know if I'm being a bit too Western in my thinking here, but I notice that I tend to, when I do my own napping, I tend to try to make things a bit more symmetrical than was necessarily the way that those guys thought about it. pressure flaking on this margin because I find it so hard to hold.
big spot there. Most of it. Okay. You know, I'm really tempted to do one more series along this edge and try to get that ridge a bit more pronounced. If I'm gonna do it, I better do it now. Yeah, that went to there and just stopped. That's part of the, part of the reason it does that is because the, in this method, if we were doing North American style, you're compressing the face. If you're not using a slotted block, you're compressing the face of the biface and it causes the flakes to kind of curl over that midline. With the Kimberly technique, and if you use a slotted block, um, it, so the flake can come away free, it'll end pretty much at the center line and you can develop a bit more of a ridge down the middle. See that one ended about the same spot. And that's part of the design criteria of these Kimberly points is that ridge. They actually have a name for it, an Aboriginal word for it. See it wobbles a little bit, my ridge goes over in this area. It's kind of down the middle, but then since those flakes weren't invasive enough, I didn't push it over far enough. And so when we're talking about the pedantics of the design, it would be better if those went further. Being uh, 
a little bit cautious. And that's always a a not so good thing. You gotta be bold when you're napping. So I've pushed it over, you can see the, the ridge developing there. I've pushed it over to the middle here. It's still a little bit to the left in that area. I wonder if I should try to move it on down. How am I doing shape? Because every time you take flakes off, you lose a bit of the width, of course. Well, I could go for that, or I could just leave it alone. You get a bit obsessive about this napping stuff and then try to get it perfect. I'm not too keen to get a ridge developed on that side. I want the ridge to be on the other side. bit of tip off. This is where it would be useful to have uh, better vision. I don't have real good close-up vision anymore. I'm wearing my reading glasses to do this, but one of my favorite historic photos of a Kimberly Aborigine doing this. He's leaning about this close to the point. His face is just centimeters away from the point that he's working on. That's how detailed the work was. He was probably serrating the point, which I hope to do here in a minute if I don't break the blade in this late stage. My the width of my pressure flaker probably a bit much now. It was okay for the heavy work. Now it's probably a bit too thick to tip for this fine work because it's harder to, to get the delicate platforms with such a wide tip. See how they all ended in the middle? Nice series. That's good. That's what you want. And I've got the edge actually elevated above the anvil. It's not pressing against the anvil because if it were, it would torque the tip and it would just pop off. I don't want to do that. Oh, it's just about to get in my work area here. Hopefully the exposure on the camera won't go all crappy.
chair ridge developing. Got a, a key that you know, can put together of all the Aboriginal words from all the different language groups in the Kimberley for the different parts of the point. There's a name for that, but I can't remember it right offhand what that ridge is called. There's any doubt that young people with their acute eyesight would be able to nail this last attribute much better than those of us whose eyesight started to go. loops. Pretty pleased with the ridge. It's nice and prominent, kind of losing its way here at the extreme tip. That's because I can't see. Um, there's some beautiful Kimberley Point, probably all made by the same mapper in Broome in Western Australia in the 1930s or in the collection at the WA Museum. And each one has its incredibly, incredibly fine tip. Probably twice the length of that. But it comes down to an incredibly narrow, tiny little tip. And most of them, the Flint mapper then took some thread, some sewing thread and wrapped it around the tips to protect them. Probably meant for trade. Clean up. I still got some remnant platforms. I'm just going to go down that edge and clean up some of those. Kind of careful of that tip. Still bugs me that little island there.
I'm just gonna I mean you can do this all day you can just keep picking away at it and working on the shape and maybe go after another hot spot or try to get more of the stuff and eventually it disappears you will it away until it's a pencil and then it's all gone or you break it one or the other so part of the half the battle on the napping is knowing when to stop but I'm not stopping because I still haven't serrated it um, I'm gonna do that next I'm not real good at serrations but uh, the way that, that they did it it's described as, as it's almost like sawing the uh, teeth into the edge of these points. Charge the battery. Now we're in the full sun. It's been a long process making. Okay, serrating. Get stuck into it, eh? Just the one I started on. Creating is much easier the thinner the edge is. my poor eyes and I'm doing this kind of a, more of a, almost like a denticulate sort of serrating there is these micro serrations you get on points uh, in parts of the Kimberley that you know 11 12 per centimeter that's how fine they are Doing the coarser serrations. Using the other end of my tool, I've got another spatula tip there. Ground down to a very sharp edge. See the serrations coming along there. Try to put your teeth too close together because they can propagate sideways and lop off the, the projection. And that sucks when that happens. And I'll probably get a bit of that. I usually get a bit of that. When they had metal, they'd use the uh, fibula, which is that very skinny leg bone from the kangaroo. It's 
see Get a bit of dust on here shows up when it's sunny like this but some of those serration flakes are actually running up quite a ways Collapsed a bit platform. A little trouble seeing it so bright. Be cognizant of where your tip is because you don't want to accidentally have it in contact with the anvil when you're pressing down here and blow it off. See, there's one that I blew off the, the teeth between those two serrations. That's a bummer. Did it again. Not quite so bad that time. Though.
Oops. Pretty good to win. down here. Blew up another one. It's the danger when you get into those thick areas. Up one remnant that I didn't get rid of. Might call it good. Uh, can't really point. There's the tip that got blown off. It would have been, been a little bit longer had I not done that at an earlier stage of reduction. But that's the way these things go. How would I evaluate this? Well, I think it's within the range of variation. It has all the key attributes of a Kimberly point. It's made on the side of the, the bottle. Um, basal edge isn't really that finished, um, which is pretty typical. They would encase these in uh, uh, resin uh, when they hafted them up on spear points. So uh, it wasn't as essential that the base be thin because it wasn't put into a split shaft, per se. Um, it's got the, the ridge, I don't know if you can see it in the uh, video, but it's got the ridge from pretty pronounced from about there to the tip. That's a key part of the design of these points. It's hardly, uh, it would fit within the range of variation, but it's hardly a, a, a masterpiece. Um, serrations are, are not that fine. Irregular. I blew some off between there. Didn't entirely eliminate the dorsal surface. Um, there's still little remnant patches there. And ventral surface is reasonably good, but uh, I have seen them with a fair bit more reduced than that. Sometimes you can eliminate it altogether. But overall, it's within the range of variation. And the point being that it was that uh, I made it with the, the whole Kimberly reduction method. All right. Um, something like this you could whip out uh, really quickly using the North American method because that's what I'm used to. So I could, could
could uh, make something like this in a fraction amount of time. But it's always good to, to learn the traditional techniques that other people would use. It really gives you some insights into fracture mechanics and the way that people in the past use those to advantage to produce um, stone tools. I don't know if that, that tip, you can see the tip with that ridge down the, down the middle. All right, a point like this is uh, right on the cusp of being a prestige point. Um, about 50 millimeters is the cutoff between ones that they would use typically in hunting and ones that they would bundle up and uh, send to their trade partners down the line. Um, this one looks like it's maybe a bit over 50 millimeters, so it might be called a prestige point rather than a utilitarian one. But in any case, that's how uh, Kimberly points are made. So. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, yeah, I hope you give it a go, and have some success at it. Cheers.